All right, it's time for another question show. Your questions, my answers, wherever you are, across my channel. If a question pops into your brain, just write it down on any video. I'll gather a bunch of them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into it. Eric, 2000. Cool video, Mr. Kane. One question, are you optimistic about humanity? Yeah, in general, I am a massive optimist. I think I'm like the most optimistic person all my friends know, they're all like, pessimists, realists, I'm the optimist. Uh, and when you look at all the statistics, right, all of the uh, uh, like gross domestic product and poverty rates and infant mortality and various disease, and all of these things that are happening across the planet, everything is moving in the right direction. There are a bunch of big issues like climate change and biodiversity loss and other kinds of issues. But in general, everything is moving in the right direction. But at the same time, I am definitely a, uh, I'm concerned about the existential risks. So things like AI getting away from us or bio weapons being developed, you know, people can very inexpensively create a, a plague that can kill everybody on the planet. Um, or who knows? So I think in general, I am very optimistic about humanity. And then there are some big issues that I am concerned about that we should fix. And I think us being able to move to space flight, of course, gives us that that second chance. So I think there's a lot of good reasons why we should definitely keep working on our space exploration efforts. Although if the AI happens, then it'll just chase us to space and then it won't matter. So but yeah, humans, very optimistic. Wilhelmo de Occidento. Does the expansion of the 3D grid happen equally everywhere? For example, is the expansion the same within the solar system versus within a galaxy versus the space between galaxies versus the space between galaxy clusters, etc, etc. Right, so I'm I keep going talking about this grid as a way to understand the expansion of the universe, this grid that extends infinitely in all directions. And over time, uh, the the space between the grid, the squares in the grid are getting bigger, and everything is moving away from each other. And so space itself is getting bigger, that it is the momentum left over from the Big Bang, whatever caused that, it is the acceleration of this expansion due to dark energy. But then at a local level, you've got galaxies that are able to hold their themselves together, hold them through their gravity, and the gravity overcomes this expansion. And so on a local level, you know, this expansion isn't going to tear a galaxy apart. It's not going to tear a planet apart. It's not going to tear you apart or make you expand <laughs> just eating does that. So and a, a way to think about that, right, is that we're standing on the Earth, and the Earth has an enormous amount of gravity, right, an incomprehensible amount of mass, and it is pulling you down so that you don't fly off into space. But at the same time, your atomic force holds your parts, you know, holds all of your molecules together and stops you from just sort of squishing in and being absorbed by the Earth. And so at a local level, yeah, the, the gravity of the Earth is dominant, but at a local level, your atomic force holding your particles, your chemical bonds, holding your molecules together is stronger than the force of gravity. And so you don't get absorbed into the Earth. And it's the same idea. The Milky Way is the space that the Milky Way is embedded in is expanding, but the Milky Way is able to hold on to itself and not get expanded. Seymour Onion. How do they keep dust off the mirrors on large ground based optical telescopes such as the Grand Telescopio Canarias? Yeah, so the big telescopes around the world do get atmospheric dust that slowly falls down on them. And you don't want to just go and brush it off because then you're going to scratch these incredibly sensitive mirrors. So what happens is every few years, all the big telescopes are designed that you can pull the big mirror out, and you ship it to a special facility, sometimes it's relatively close, sometimes it's pretty far, and you get it very carefully cleaned and recoded and repolished and then returned back to the observatory to continue for several more years of work. And so this has to happen every couple of years. And it's a very nerve wracking process when the observatory has to get shut down and have its instruments cleaned and repolished so that it can go back into operation. So there you go. Diaz is AC. What would happen if Olympus Mons was going to erupt? Are the rovers safe? 
From what we can tell, Olympus Mons and all of the other big volcanoes on Mars are dead. Uh, they're not going to erupt anytime soon. And we would see recent eruptions. That said, you know, some geologists think that maybe there's still some magma underneath Mars. And this is why Mars Insight is there right now, searching for evidence that there's any kind of geological activity on Mars. Uh, if the volcanoes erupted, they are shield volcanoes. And so what they do is they have, they erupt a very, uh, viscous lava that flows down the flanks of the volcano and just adds to the size of it. And they're all the rovers are very far away from Olympus Mons and the other big volcanoes. So, uh, maybe they would push up some ash into the atmosphere that would potentially block the, uh, the sun's rays, like the dust storm that happened that killed opportunity. But curiosity is, nuclear powered or it has a nuclear battery in it. Uh, same thing with the Mars 2020 rover when it arrives inside is solar powered. So again, it would be and if those volcanoes erupted, I mean, I think all the world space agencies, space agencies would see this as a tremendous opportunity to study Mars at a time uh, in in a way that is unprecedented to see this active volcanism happening on Mars and to study it. Oh, they would love it. So it would be worth it, even if they had to lose a rover, I think. Invincible. Have we tried to see through the booty's void? Can we see the other side of the void with infrared? I don't know why the booty's void is like freaking people out. My guess is there's a bunch of bad videos on YouTube that are saying a bunch of stuff that isn't real. That picture you've seen of the booty's void isn't really it. That's like some dark nebula that is just a cloud of dark gas that's blocking the starlight behind it. But the actual void, all it is, is it's a, it's a region of less density in the universe. So there are regions of higher density, things we call like galaxies and galaxy clusters. And over time, the gravity of all these galaxies and galaxy clusters is pulling them together. And that's opening up spaces in between. So you've got a bunch of galaxies over here, you got a bunch of galaxies over here, and their gravity is pulling them together and their gravity is pulling them together. And you're getting this space that's opening up in between with less density. And that is a void, a super void. And all it just means is that if you go into that area, you're going to find less galaxies, less atoms, less stars, but you're still going to find galaxies. You're still going to find, uh, even galaxy clusters in some of them. It's just the density is lower. And yeah, we can absolutely see through them because there's not a lot of stars and dust and things in between so that you can see right through them to the galaxy clusters and walls and structures that are on the other side. So no problem. Don't worry about the booty's void. It is just like a, it's just like less galaxy stuff in the universe. Federico Fudio Alvarez. If we put a bunch of telescopes on different planets, asteroids, etc., would we be able to make a giant telescope array like the Event Horizon Telescope? I think I mentioned this last time that the Event Horizon Telescope worked because it is in the radio wavelength, specifically the 1.2 millimeter wavelength. When you're thinking of a telescope, you're imagining something in the visible wavelength. And this idea of interferometry only really works um, after the fact if you're shooting in this in this wavelength. That said, there are plans right now, there are some proposals to build space based telescopes that would join the Event Horizon Telescope, they would be in orbit around the Earth. Uh, they wouldn't go as far as other asteroids in the moon and places like that, because you still got to get that data. I mean, remember how difficult it was to carry mountains of hard drives back to your single location so you could do all your data processing. So you would still want to have these telescopes relatively close so they could communicate their information really quickly. But but putting radio telescopes in space to make the telescope bigger, make it 10 times as big as the Earth, 20 times as big as the Earth. Now you're really talking and there's some really interesting simulations that have been done to show what that improvement might look like. And I'm sure with the success of the Event Horizon Telescope, we will see space based radio telescopes join the network. And in the coming years, that view is going to get even better. I can't wait. Zastarino. 
Would we ever be able to see events like supernovae in real time? I guess we need to understand what real time means. I mean, when a supernova, when it, like when a, when a gigantic star detonates as a supernova, we don't notice until after the explosion has happened. It, it, occasionally, we can go back through old surveys, astronomers go through old surveys, and they find the actual star that exploded before, you know, in, in some survey. And they're like, oh, here's the star, and now it's gone. <laughs> And they know that that's where the supernova happened. And what's really useful about that is like right in those last moments, say a week before the star exploded, you can see what it looked like and use that to kind of define what are the precursors of a supernova. Um, but to actually like see it in real time, well, I mean, all the worlds, when there's a really powerful telescope, a really powerful supernova, all the world's telescopes point at this object and all scan it and try to analyze the data. But it's not like it's a very big object, right? It is, you know, all the supernova that we've seen are outside of the galaxy in, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of light years away. The closest supernova that we've been able to see is the one that happened in the large Magellanic cloud with the, or was it the small Magellanic? 19, 1987A. Um, and that was, you know, still within this galaxy. So I'm sure that if one happened relatively close inside the galaxy, all the world's telescopes would point at it. They would be able to see a pretty stunning sort of aftershock of the galaxy, of, of the supernova going off to see the shock waves coming out of it and watch the expanding cloud of gas over the next few decades. Uh, I can't wait. And we're due for one. So at some point, one will happen. James T. Why exactly are there single asteroids with trillions of dollars worth of rare Earth metals, whereas the Earth is so much less concentrated with them? Well, the Earth, of course, is made with roughly the same stuff as the asteroids. It's just that with the Earth, the Earth is, you know, most of its volume is inside of it. We can only access this thin little skin on the outside of the Earth. And we have, right? We have, we have explored many corners of the Earth mined a lot of the easily accessible minerals in tremendous amounts. With an asteroid, you could like dismantle the entire asteroid and get at all of its various precious resources in a way that you just can't do with the Earth. And so I think that's the advantage is just lower gravity on these asteroids, easier to get at, dismantle the whole thing and then just sort of look through. I just kind of imagine like, you know, like dump your Lego pile and then just sort all the parts, right? And then go like, oh good, here's all the gold, here's all the platinum, here's all the, I don't know, palladium, iridium, and gather that stuff up and be able to use it back here on Earth. While with the Earth, we have to just like dig down deep into it and find the deposits where we can. So that's why. Time of dying. Hey Fraser, I've got a question. What are the main problems to solve to get people living on Venus? Is it possible that people living on Venus may become easier or more viable in getting people to live on Mars? Thanks, keep up the good work. Uh, well, I always say that Mars is the worst, but that's like second to Venus. Venus is the, is the real worst. The only thing that Venus has going for it over Mars is that the gravity on Venus is roughly the same as the gravity on Earth. But of course, the temperature down at the surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. The pressure is the same as being a kilometer down in the ocean, 90 something times more pressure than the Earth's atmosphere. The, um, the, it rains sulfuric acid. The atmosphere is made of carbon dioxide. Uh, it takes a very long time for it to turn once you could outwalk the day length. So Venus is bad for a bunch of reasons. Now the only like reasonably acceptable place on Venus is high up in the cloud tops. If you're tens of kilometers up in, in the atmosphere, then the temperature and the pressure get closer to Earth normal. And in fact, uh, just breathable air becomes a lifting gas. You could float around in your dirigible. But you know, like, <laughs> Like that would be terrible. Why would you want to live there, right? Earth, Earth is the best. Um, so I would say if I had to pick a place to live, I'd choose Mars over Venus. But I definitely think that we should be exploring Venus and we should definitely be exploring Mars. And maybe we'll learn new techniques to try and live on these worlds in the future. Dandy. 
Trampoline, yeehaw, love your channel. Very important scientific education and high quality, motivating news and insights you deliver. My question, is the turning of rockets sideways when going to orbit controlled or is it happening by itself due to the gravity pull? Yeah, when you see a rocket, right, the rocket takes off, it's pointing straight up, and then over time it comes over to the side and then most of the, really it's going sideways into the orbital velocity that it needs to be going. And rockets have a bunch of ways that they can turn themselves. One way is that they actually have fins with uh, ailerons on them. I don't know the technical term, uh, but they can sort of change their angle. They also have gimbals on their rocket, so they can actually change the angle that the rocket engines are going. Uh, and they can also, especially when they get up above the atmosphere, they can have uh, thrusters that they can shoot to sort of change their orientation. And so they can use all of those to change their orientation as they're flying to be able to go from that straight up to horizontal as they go into orbit. Gene Steeler UK. Fraser, are gravitational waves being created all the time or just with very large collisions? How is it possible for LIGO and the other laser interferometer telescopes to differentiate between background noise caused by stellar collisions, or is that just not a thing that we have the sensitivity to detect now or maybe never at any point in the future? Right, so every single moving mass in the universe is generating gravitational waves all the time. As you walk, you are generating gravitational waves, but the gravitational waves are really subtle and there's no way really for us to detect them. It's only with the most extreme events that we can actually detect the gravitational waves. And in fact, you know, we can't even detect supermassive black holes merging into each other because that process is too slow. It has to be these medium sized mass black holes that are spinning around each other. And in the final moments, just before they collide, you get these gravitational waves. And now we're starting to be able to detect neutron stars. So, so as the sensitivity as they, you know, as this new science gets developed, the sensitivity of the detectors are going to get better. The, the kinds of extreme events they're going to be able to detect will start to come down. They'll be able to, to detect more massive black holes coming together more slowly. They're going to be able to detect smaller mass black holes coming together in the way that they do. They're going to be able to detect black holes eating neutron stars, neutron stars colliding with each other in different ways, and maybe even neutron stars which are off axis and just sort of wobbling as they turn. So that's sort of what the future holds. Um, as we discover more, I can't wait. IDES 385. How can you tell the size and distance of an interstellar object without a clear orbit? I imagine you could measure how it crosses stars, but that doesn't seem like enough information alone. Telling the size of an object is actually really tough to do. And you're exactly right that, that a lot of the estimates for, say, the size of Kuiper Belt objects is, is very rough. And astronomers get these really unique opportunities when one of these Kuiper Belt objects passes in front of a, of a star and you get this, you measure how the light changes from the star as the object is passing in front of it. And that gives you the most direct measurement that you can make until that point. It's really like, Astronomers know roughly what this stuff is made out of, like say it's made out of ice or maybe it's made out of very darkened ice, and they know how much light is coming from it and they can do a rough estimate to guess about how big it would have to be to be able to generate that kind of illumination. But if they get those occ occultations, then they're able to zero in more carefully. And of course, with the the way planets are being found, you've got a star, you've got a planet passing in front of the star, we can see really how much of the light it darkens as it goes in front. And astronomers are able to estimate the size of those planets very well, not necessarily the mass, but the size. So that's how they do it. Well, all right, that was awesome. Another question joke got very dark. I'm shooting sort of near the end of the day. Thanks everyone for sending in your questions. I really appreciate it. As always, if a question pops into your brain while you're watching any one of my videos, just type down your question. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, I'll see you next week.